<clears throat> well, good evening, church family. Um, welcome to the third and final part of uh, Revelation chapter 19. Um, you know, what, what, what an amazing chapter it has been. Um, it, it's really one of those chapters I think that um, I, I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for the last 18 chapters to get to chapter 19. Because I knew what was going to happen in chapter 19 and, and to be able to get to where we got last week and, and in verse 11 see that the heavens had opened up and, and Jesus was on his way down was, um, was really a blessing to get to and, and to teach and to study and, and to share with you guys and, and I hope that it was a blessing to you guys um, as well. We're going to finish out Revelation chapter 19 tonight um, verses 17 through 21. It's just the last um, few verses uh, that we're going to go over. So um, if you've got your Bibles ready or your handout, you can just follow along there. But let me read these last few verses and then um, I just kind of want to do a general quick overview, quickish, not so quick maybe. I kind of just keep going down the scale, right? Um, of chapter 19 um, and, and, then, and then we'll close it out tonight. Uh, John writes in verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. A, a, a little, a little dark to end um, chapter chapter nineteen, but but there's a reason for that, right? These these people that John is writing about are those that are still on earth that have come to battle against Jesus, and so to kind of end in on, on that dark uh, on that dark verse, uh, man, somebody's popular tonight. I'm sorry. That's all right. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Anyways, church family, pray with me, and uh, and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I thank you so much, Lord. As as we just sung the song, "Peace be still," I'm reminded of Psalm 46 and 10. Be still and know that I am God. And Lord, I, I often go to that verse when I'm when I'm anxious, Lord, when I'm restless. Maybe sometimes when I'm nervous, Lord, when I'm a little fired up, Lord, I have to remind myself to be still uh, and know that you are God. And I pray tonight, Lord, that if there's anything in our hearts tonight, Father, that would cause us to be riddled with anxiety, riddled with fear, riddled with, uh, Lord God, nervousness, anxiousness, whatever's going on in our lives, Lord, will we be reminded of the peace that we have in you, the peace that Jesus Christ said he left with us, that peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray tonight that that peace would, would resonate in our hearts and in our minds, that it would fall upon us tonight as we need it. Lord God, I pray for your blessings in tonight's service as we finish out Revelation chapter 19 and, and just ask for your favor over the remainder of this study. Lord, it's in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So a couple of weeks back when we started uh, chapter 19, you know, in chapter 19 starts out again after the, the, the couple of parenthetical chapters that we had studied in 17 and 18. And of course, John writes after these things. And, and there was a debate maybe of after what things since we kind of came off a parenthetical chapter. We know that um, on, on, in chapter 16, if we were to skip 17 and 18 with the knowledge that they're parenthetical and, and really pick up in, in 16 verse 21 and attach that to 19 verse 1, we know that at the end of, of, of chapter 16 was the end of the vile judgments. And so it could be maybe assumed that as soon as that last vile judgment takes place with the plague of hail coming down, 
and, 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 and that happening here on earth, that all of a sudden Revelation 19, 1 begins, right? Um, or maybe it is the end of chapter 18, where we know that Babylon was finally destroyed. Her destruction had come upon um, all that were living in her and, and around her. And of course, the world saw this destruction. And verse 19, or verse uh, 1 of chapter 19 picks up, and after these things. And so we don't know specifically where it lies chronologically in regards to the rest of Revelation. But what was said in verse 1 is that uh, much people in heaven were singing Alleluia, praise be the Lord, salvation, glory, and honor, and power uh, uh, belong unto the Lord. What clearly had happened prior to verse 1 was enough for heaven to know what took place and begin to say hallelujah because something happened that they knew was going to be a trigger if you will to the events that we would continue to read on in revelation chapter 19 and so these begin praising the lord and, and as they're praising the lord it, it continues and then we see there too as well that in verse 4 of chapter 19 that the 420 elders that we read about way back in the beginning of revelation and the four beasts also fell down and begin to say, Alleluia, and worship God, right? And so there's this big heavenly chorus going on at the beginning part of, uh, of Revelation chapter 19 that is causing everybody to worship God and to say, Alleluia, praise be the, praise be the Lord. Why? Because it, something happened that would drive them to do this because they knew what was going to happen afterwards. And so as we carried on that first week or the first part of, of Revelation chapter 19, the voice comes out of heaven in, in verse 5 and, and says, Praise our God, all ye his servants. There was also great thunderings taking place out of heaven, the voice of mighty thunders. The, the, uh, the scriptures say the voice of many waters. And after this took place around verse 7, we see that the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready, the wife being the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. And, and if you recall, I, I kind of shared a little bit about the, the, the ancient Jewish uh, tradition when it came to the wedding. And how, how that Jewish tradition beautifully complemented what we know to be the marriage between the bridegroom and the bride... Jesus Christ and the church and how that Jewish wedding really complements what Jesus has done for us and, and how the church has been prepared for him. And we know that the church, of course, was, was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Um, and, and John is told, write, John is told in verse 9 to write this, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are we. We, we've been called under the marriage supper of lamb, and John is told to write those things. Last week, as we picked up the second part, we saw John fall at the foot of, of, of this deliverer of news and begin to worship him. And, and, and this, this deliverer, this, this, this person, says, I'm a fellow servant of yours. I also have the testimony of Jesus Christ, meaning he's received the gospel. And it was interesting last week, if you remember, trying to figure out, well, who is this? Because again, John was the longest living apostle. I believe John crossed paths at some point with Paul in some way, shape, or form. John also knew what Moses and Elijah looked like from the Mount of Transfiguration. So who is this person that John falls at the feet of and begins to worship that he doesn't know who it is who happens to be a fellow brethren who's received the testimony of Jesus Christ? And so that was interesting to kind of, well, who is this person? Who's that man that's delivering that news or the woman that maybe is even delivering that news and and of course, we, we get to the, 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 the apex, if you will, of, of Revelation chapter 19, and, and that is verse 11. And, and John writes that he saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse, and 
He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And, and really that, that right there, that verse is what all, all of us have been waiting for for the last 18 and a half chapters is to get to this point. Verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19, because heaven is open and the second coming of Jesus Christ is now um, upon us. And, and I love some of the descriptions. And, and, and we, we, of course, went back and looked at other um, uh, scripture that described possibly what Christ would look like on his way down to heaven. Verse 12, of course, likens his eyes to flames of fire. His head, uh, on his head were many crowns. And, and, and we had read previously um, in Revelation chapter 1 that his hair was as white as wool, like the white uh, uh, of snow. And so you can imagine these, these flaming eyes and these crowns upon his head with, these, with this long, flowing, white, beautiful hair. Um, you know, and, and what Jesus looked like. And, and of course, he had... Um, his vesture, the, the raiment that he was wearing, was dipped in blood. And, and, and I believe, personally, for that to be the blood um, of, of, of himself, of Jesus Christ, that sacrificial blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And uh, we had a little bit of fun last week talking about the Word of God. John, of course, used that expression or that name to, to address him in, in, in John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But, but we get this description of Jesus now coming down out of heaven for the first time since ascending up in, in, in Acts chapter 1, not coming down as a baby being delivered out of, out of a virgin, not coming down to be born in a manger, not coming down to be brought up and raised in the temple or to be sacrificed on the cross. Jesus Christ is coming down to establish his kingdom and to rule and reign here on earth forevermore. And so we get a different picture of Jesus now than we got when you read the opening parts of the Gospels when he came as a baby. And throughout his life that we read in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what's interesting too, and I talked about this, that there was a name written on him that, that no man would know but him. And whether or not we come to know that name, um, I, I don't know. Um, but one of the cool things as well is, is that behind Jesus is the church. The, the, the armies of heaven, which is us followed him on white horses as well, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And if we jump back up to, to uh, uh, verse 5 or 6, I believe, when it uh, excuse me, verse 7, uh, when it talks about the bride, the bride, of course, is described as being clothed in fine linen, white and clean, right? And so the, the, the church, the armies which were in heaven, is coming behind Jesus, also riding these white horses. And, you know, I've seen... Um, I, I've seen art depictions. I've even seen movies try to um, recreate this scene, if you will. You know, where, where, where you've got Jesus, you know, he's the lead horse and, and his eyes are aflame and his hair, his locks are flowing and, and he's got that sword and, and he's got the name written on him and behind him are, are a, a, a sea of people that nobody can count. Um, what a sight that is going to be for not only us who get to see it as we descend with Christ, but if you're on earth and you look up and see that, boy, I tell you what, there ain't a rock ain't nobody going to be able to, be able to hide under. I can only imagine how frightening it's going to be. And I made a comment last week too. There is going to be zero doubt as to who it is that's coming. Zero doubt. They're going to know it's Jesus. First of all, the name is written on him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which, which was in our text. They'll see that vesture dipped in blood. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. Make no doubt about it. They're going to know it's Christ. They're going to know it's him. And of course, when we got to verse 15, we saw that out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And, and, and for... Many a years, I thought, and, and I believe because it's taught, and, and, and whether or not it's taught in there, I, I, I don't want to have that debate. Um, but 
the sword has always been likened to in the scriptures, the word of God. And, 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 I, and I tried to do my best to um, correlate the sword proceeding out of his mouth with the very word of God in coming to the understanding that I don't think Jesus is going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger was in Conan the Barbarian, and he's slaying and, and chopping and lopping and thrusting through, and, you know, he's just this big muscular dude that, you know, speaks in an Austrian accent. That's not going to be Jesus, right? He doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to wield a sword. He doesn't need to thrust a sword. He doesn't need to go to battle. He's not going to be on in the valley of, of, of Megiddo. He's not going to be on the ground fighting off soldiers and, you know, kicking one this way while he's stabbing the one this way and then taking it and swinging it. Jesus doesn't need to do that. He's Jesus. But via the very word of God, the sword, Ephesians 6, and I shared this last week, we we're talking about the armor of God. We're supposed to wield the sword of the spirit. And Paul says, which is the word of God. There's no greater weapon, ladies and gentlemen, that has been formed for us than that of the Word of God. And, and, and yes, we can argue all day long that, that, that a, a rifle or a gun would have a purpose in battle, and even a sword or a knife would have purpose in battle. And, and if we want to get really Stone Age, a, a stick or a slingshot, uh, would have a purpose in battle, but there's no greater weapon formed for you and I than the very word of God. And as a matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself, when Satan was tempting him in the wilderness for those 40 days, he didn't battle Satan. He didn't battle him. He just spoke the word of God. And the word of God was enough to defeat Satan. And it's going to be enough, I believe, when the day of the Lord happens to defeat all his enemies that are gathered to to fight Jesus Christ. And the 16th and final verse that, that we talked about last week, and again on his vesture, he has the uh, uh, name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again, there's no mistake as to who this is that's coming down. The whole world's going to know that it's Jesus Christ. And so we pick up in verse 17 and 18, and, and I'll read it. And, and John writes, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourself together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. You know, you could almost picture this image. And, 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 I, and as I was preparing for this, I, I, I had this image in my head. That's why I'm sharing it with you. You have this, and I've seen it before. Superman is up in the sky, and behind him is the, is the big bright sun, and you can just see enough Superman to know it's Superman. The cape is sort of, is sort of uh, waving in the wind as he's up in the air. But, but when, when, when John writes this, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, I'm like, well, man, this angel's probably up in the sky. Be, the backdrop of the angel is the sun, and so you see this image, maybe even just the outline of this angel up in the sun. And it, to me, it was kind of like a comic book, you know, but I'm just a kid at heart, and that's why. Maybe a movie poster. But this angel with the sun behind him as a backdrop, commands the fowls of the air. Now, now, when, when he says that uh, the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, he's just talking about the sky, the, the atmosphere that we can see right here with the naked eye, right? But he commands the fowls of the air to gather for a great feast. And so this angel, interesting to note, has commandment over the birds to command them to come or to start to um, uh, uh, descend, if you will, on this valley, this valley of Megiddo. But this isn't a normal feast. This feast involves royalty. This is a feast that involves royalty. This is a feast that involves 
high-ranking individuals. It involves mighty men of battle. The text even suggests, and if you're an animal lover, I'm sorry, that the very horses that were brought to battle will be part of this feast as well. But they are not guests of the Lord. They are not guests of the Lord, but rather as enemies of the Lord who are going to be executed by the very breath of the lips of Jesus Christ and whose flesh is being given over to the prey of the sky. Great men, mighty men. Verse 18, again, it says that ye may eat the flesh of kings. There's your royalty. The flesh of captains, high-ranking individuals, the flesh of mighty men. Mighty men is an expression used in the Old Testament to talk about men that were great at war. This is no normal feast. This feast involves all the great, and I'm not going to call them great because they're great individuals, but it, it, it involves all the great men and women that are still left on earth. All the great kings, all the great leaders, all the great uh, uh, individuals, the armies, the captains, the generals. It says all men will be there. You know, Ezekiel 37, 17 through 20 speaks of a prophetic event similar to what John writes to us in our text. Ezekiel would write this. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast in the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, and of all the fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till you be full, and drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots with mighty men and with all men of war, saith the Lord God." That was a commandment to the fowls, the birds of the air, what I just read out of Ezekiel. And so it's interesting that, that, that chapter 37 of Ezekiel, again, verses 17 through 20, seems to line up with what is taking place right now in Revelation chapter 19, in that all the fowls of the earth are commanded to gather to feast on kings and to feast on captains, Similarly to what Ezekiel wrote down, that they would be feasting, again, on kings, the flesh of the mighty, the blood of the princes. It's just interesting. He goes on to say in verse 19, And I saw the beast, the beast being the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And so, since verse 11, we, we've seen a sequence of events take place here, okay? We, we've seen heaven opened up in verse 11. John describes, as, as John is clearly looking up, John describes seeing heaven open. John describes the dissension of Jesus Christ and what he look like, looks like. He describes the church following after him, as he's, as he's descending, we hear an angel command the fowls of the earth to basically, hey, come and join us right now because um, we're fixing to prepare a meal for you, okay? Then John's attention turns to what he sees on the ground. So he's gone from looking up to looking at the sun, the angel with the backdrop of the sun, to, to what's going on on the ground. And, and John says that he sees the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth gathered together to make war against Jesus Christ and against his army. Listen, folks, they are not only there to battle Christ, but they're there to battle us as well. They, 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 they want to fight us as well. Why? Because we've been victorious. 
we've been victorious. Because Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and all throughout history, anybody associated with Jesus Christ joins that boat right there. If, if, if they hate Jesus, they hate us. Didn't Jesus write something about that in, in Matthew, I believe? If they hate you, know that they hated me first. So John sees the Antichrist and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against Jesus and against his army. Now remember again back in Revelation chapter 16, when the sixth vile judgment was opened, it is revealed how the armies of the earth got assembled there. We studied and we looked at, well, how did all these people eventually get gathered in, in Megiddo? Revelation 16, verse 12, 13, and 14 says this. Well, I'll, actually, I'll read through 16. It says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them Speaking about the Antichrist, he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And so we know how the kings of the earth got there. We know how the armies got there. They were deceived by the spirits that proceeded out of the mouth of the, uh, of the beast, and out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the false prophet. These, these devils, these demons were sent forth to deceive all the kings of the earth the rulers of the world, to come to the Valley of Megiddo, to come to Armageddon for a great battle. Now, what they're told, how they're deceived, is never made clear in the Bible, but they are lied to, which would make perfect sense because the devil's the author of lies, he's the father of lies, and there's no truth in him, right? But they're lied to to the point to where they believe whatever's being said to gather there in Armageddon. So we know how they got there. The sixth vial dries up the Euphrates River. It allows the Euphrates to be crossed from the east. And if you guys recall, I, I highlighted a couple of pretty big countries that were to the east of Israel at the time, or, or today, India being one, China being another, major billion-plus people population countries, right? Which would have some pretty big armies. But again, the whole world's gathered together. Whether it's China or India, it doesn't matter. The whole world's come together with, with one thing in common, to, to go to battle against Jesus Christ. And so these spirits of devils, these demonic spirits, use the working of miracles, deception and deceit to gather all the kings of the earth, and all, the, uh, all their armies to Armageddon. And it's when they are assembled there. Now think about this. It's when they are assembled there that we can jump up to verse 11. Then I saw the heavens opened up. Then I, Because Jesus ain't coming until they're there. Because Jesus is specifically coming down to Armageddon, to the valley of Megiddo. And so it is, is, it is at that point that the armies of the world are gathered there that the heavens opened up and Jesus is coming down. This isn't an event that's a week-long event, ladies and gentlemen. This is happening in rapid succession, right? In verse 20, it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so heaven is open. John sees Jesus coming down with the church. 
He sees the angel make the announcement to the fowls of the earth. He sees the, the armies gathered in Megiddo. Then he sees the beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire alive. Now, it appears that before Jesus does anything with the kings and rulers, the armies of the earth, he deals directly first with the Antichrist and with the false prophet. Before he deals with anybody else, he deals with those two. That's the first, that's the first indication of Jesus casting judgment, if I can, on the earth directly is in dealing with the beast and the false prophet. And he does so by casting them alive into the lake of fire. Now what's interesting is when we talked about the wine press, there, there's clearly a great slaughter that's going to take place in the valley of Megiddo. I, I believe that the Lord's going to speak a word and, I mean, bodies are just going to be dropped like that. But the beast and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire. What's also extremely interesting, now, now keep in mind, the beast and the false prophet are, they're human beings for all intents and purposes. They, they're, they're, they're born, they're walking on earth. They're not these spirits well, they're filled with spirits that have descended from the pits of hell, but they are, they're, they're individuals, they're people, flesh and blood like, like you and I are, the beasts and the false prophets. It appears that they completely bypass the great white throne of judgment. They completely bypass it. Why? Because once you're thrown into that lake of fire, as we'll continue in our study, that's permanent. You're not coming back from that. That is your eternal judgment and punishment is the lake of fire. We haven't even gotten to the great white throne of judgment yet in, in, in Revelation, but yet the beast and the Antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire, appearing to have completely bypassed, again, the great white throne of judgment. Now, you're not going to have to wait too long about the Great White Throne of Judgment because it's in Revelation chapter 20. I don't know specifically where, but I know it's in 20. And so we'll get to that over the course of the next couple of weeks. But basically, the process with this, the Great White Throne of Judgment, is that mankind is going to have to face their creator and give an account of their lives. And, 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 and we read this in the Bible. Every man and woman is going to have to face God and give an account for their life. Those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life are cast into the lake of fire. And, and, and I've spoken about this before. You either have your advocate, Jesus Christ, or, or you don't. And, and if you don't, if you are not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are cast into that lake of fire for all eternity. But it's after you face the, the great white throne in judgment. But these two seem to completely bypass that process. Jesus, for whatever reason, has probably had it up to here with them. They don't even get the privilege of facing God. They just, they just go straight, straight to the lake of fire. And this is a little silly, it's a little funny, but if you know anything about Monopoly, if you land on go directly, if you get the go directly to jail card, you do not pass go. You do not collect $200. You go straight to jail. They don't get the white throne of judgment. They, they go straight to the lake of fire. And in verse 21, the final verse of the chapter, John writes, and the remnant. Now, again, the remnant are, are those that are left. Those, it's everybody else besides the, the beast and the false prophet. The remnant is everybody else besides the beast and the false prophet. 
It says we're slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Upon his handling, if I can, of the Antichrist and the false prophet, again, by handling, I don't think he physically handled, handed them. I believe, again, just with a spoken word, go, set them to, the, the, to their eternal punishment. Jesus now turns his attention to the rest of the battlefield. As the sword proceeds out of his mouth, which is the word of God, he executes all who remain with the very breath of his lips. And, and it's at this point that the fowls, that, that the angel called earlier, that the fowls begin to partake in the supper that they were invited to. Again, they were invited to this great meal that the Lord has prepared for them. The fowls of the air begin to partake in this supper that has been prepared for them. And so now the world system is destroyed. Babylon is no more. The beast and the false prophet are no more. The world that has been against God is no more. The dragon himself, Satan himself, is fixing to get dealt with in the next chapter. We'll get to Satan directly in, in chapter 20. And Jesus has now returned in power and great glory. His eternal kingdom will soon be established where righteousness is going to abound for all eternity and where he's going to rule and reign for all eternity as well. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. And before we do the, the, the quiz, if you all have been taking notes these past few weeks, can I do any go-backs, not, not only of tonight, but did anything pop up over the last couple of weeks that we can address again or, or, or go over again for you just for clarification uh, purposes or maybe you just needed me to go back and, and repeat something to you. Dion. Um, the only thing I have to go back is can you, um, for the prophecy in Ezekiel, you kept saying 37, I think you mean 39. So Ezekiel, let me, uh, let me make sure. Ezekiel 39, you're, you're right. Thank you, for, thank you for that, actually. I don't know why I got 37. 39, 17 through, what did I read through? 20. 20. Yeah, because 39, 17, and thou son of man, say, speak unto the feathered fowl. So yes, thank you for that. Ezekiel 39, um, 17 through 20, not 37. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. 39, yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what? You know what? Um, if, if, if I think I think I know my mom's answer to this, but if I was to ask my mom what her, what the scariest Alfred Hitchcock movie is she ever watched, it's Birds. And funny enough, and listen, I'm a '70s kid, and I remember a, a teacher in school playing the movie Birds for me. Uh, I don't know why we were watching the movie Birds, but I remember watching Birds for the oh, first time. The Birds in um, in in school, but uh, man, it's it's kind of a creepy Alfred Hitchcock movie, right? And, and uh, but Birds in general, man, especially Birds of Prey, ooh boy. Um, but but interesting that that the birds were invited. There's no mention of of other than Ezekiel. There's no mention of the beasts of the earth coming to partake in this. This supper, if you will, that the Lord has prepared. Um, it's only for the fowls of, of, of the of the air. And these are your birds of prey, right? Your vultures, no doubt. Your ravens, crows, eagles, um, hawks. You know, all, all, all sorts of uh, um, uh, fowls of the air that are that are like prey birds, P R E Y birds. So um, very interesting. Bird birds are birds are a little creepy. My son 
my son, and, 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 and I'm talking about Jonathan, my son believes that all birds are actually drones that the government operates, and uh, he's a bit of a conspiracy nut about that, but he doesn't believe that birds exist, yeah. that they are uh, government drones ran, ran by the government. Birds aren't real. Birds aren't real. So, and, and he belongs to a whole social media page regarding birds not being real, and they believe they have evidence of that. So, Just, yes? I'm just wondering if you think there's any correlation with the, the birds being invited to the supper of God and in Revelation 18 and verse 2, how Babylon was fallen and became a dwelling place of demons. Birds are for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean gated bird. Yeah, and it's, I, I remember when we, because you had looked up what unclean yeah. birds were in in um, in uh, uh, Exodus for us, I believe, when, when the law was given. Um, I, I do believe that there is a correlation there, right? Because you know, it would make sense that, you know, those were all um, birds of prey, if you will, right, uh, that, that were, I guess, locked up or caged up in, in, in Babylon. It would make sense that they are released to come and, and, um, and, and enjoy, I, I guess, the supper that was prepared for them if they're going to enjoy. Well, of course, they're going to enjoy it, right, because that's just what, you know, vultures do and things like that. But um, I, but I do, I do believe that it, it is all Fowls of the uh, of of the sky. I mean, I don't think it's limited to, uh, you know, uh, unless it, you know, it's like a dove. Doves don't eat meat; they're just little herb herbivores. Well, but they eat bugs, and you know, they make a little. Part. Oh, well, then they eat bugs. There you go. <laughs> Gosh, we need to stop talking about birds, man. We, we, just, <laughs> we just got off on a completely different <laughs> tangent talking about birds right now. But uh, it, any, yes, Jan. <clears throat> I this is muddy for me. I mean. This, the Ezekiel, uh, in Ezekiel, where it talks about people coming against Israel, right? Yes. And um, and they're talking about, you know, the five basic nations, you know, Russia and Turkey and Iran and Libya and Sudan, all those people that are coming against Israel, but God protects them. That's a separate battle than what we just saw, right? That's before this so, thing. I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think at the beginning of the tribulation, what's going to take place, and 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 I'd have to go back in my notes to um, for the first. Uh, it's not chapters one, two, and three, but like around four or five. I believe that there's going to be a big attack against Israel by those nations that's going to be thwarted by God, I mean, divine protection by God, but it's going to make way for the Antichrist to come and be the peacemaker. So it's, it's, it's the two different battles. Correct, correct. Yeah, that battle, I believe, is, is, is first, first part tribulation battle, or maybe right before the rapture. Yeah. I believe that, yeah, there's going to be this big attack on Israel, but by divine intervention, it's going to be completely thwarted, but there's going to be a, there's going to be a need for peace established because tensions will be very high. Insert the Antichrist. Hey, I'll, 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 I'll bring peace and let's establish this, let's establish that. But we know at, at about the three and a half year mark, he turns his back on Israel. And, and then, of course, it gets us to, to the point we are right now. Thank you. Of course. All right. If nothing else, if we can go back at the end of the quiz, it's all good. Uh, number one, who said alleluia? Letter A, a great multitude in heaven. Number two, the marriage of what has come? The marriage of the lamb has come specifically. Uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? Prophecy, yes. In Revelation 19, 11, when heaven opened, what was beheld? A white horse. What was the name of the rider of the white horse? Faithful and true. Faithful and true. The rider of the white horse was wearing a garment dipped in? Blood. In blood, correct. Number seven, out of Jesus' mouth goes a sharp sword to strike the what? The nations. What was writ written on his thigh? 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords, all capitalized there. An angel cried to the birds, calling them to eat the flesh of who? Of kings. What was seen with the beast and the kings of the earth? Their armies, let her see. Who was thrown alive into the lake of fire? Let her be the beast and the false prophet, yes. Uh, and finally, number 12, what happened to the rest of them? They were slain by the sword, the yes. word of God. <laughs> and then, and then see, oh my, I didn't even put those two together. And then let her see, they were swallowed by birds. That is too funny. That is too funny. Well, church family, um, if you have any, if you have any go backs, um, obviously we can we can talk about that. But um, let me close this out in a word of prayer, and, and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this fantastic chapter in the Book of Revelation, Lord, and Lord, really um, one of those chapters that, as a Christian, we look so forward to because. It is the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is uh, the beginning of the establishment of the eternal reign of our Lord and Savior. And Father God, I thank you so much for giving us this opportunity and privilege to study it. Lord, to look at it, to discuss it, to talk about it. And Father, I pray that as we continue over these last uh, few chapters, 20, 21, and 22 of Revelation, Lord, that you would just bless our time here on Wednesday nights, Lord God. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Lord, for what you're going to do, Lord, and for what you've already done, Lord God. It's been more than we can ever ask or want, Lord. And we thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your compassion, Lord, for your mercy, Heavenly Father, and for your love. Bless this church family, Lord God. Go with them tonight as we depart, Lord. Put a hedge of protection around them, Lord God. Strengthen them, heal them, provide for them, whatever they need, Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus you'd give it to them. I ask and pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.